Welcome to the Now to Next podcast, where every week we provide wisdom on how to press play after a traumatic pause. If you are starting up or starting over in any area of your life or your business, subscribe and listen as we share real life stories from actual people who have pressed play and are winning after nearly losing it all. And now your host, Octoria Robinson. Are you ready to press play today? Let's get rocking, friends. Join me in welcoming Linda Plunkett. How are you? I'm wonderful. How are you? I am amazing now that I have met you. I cannot wait, guys. I'm personally ecstatic to hear this incredible story from this powerful woman that has, whoo, I don't want to steal her thunder. Let me breathe a little. Okay. Now, Linda, do you mind, for the benefit of our listeners, going ahead and sharing a a little bit about you just as a person, just so they can connect before we dive into your story? Let let them connect to you. Of course. Um, I'm married. I have two adult sons, Mm -hmm. Ian and Brian, and they live in the Jacksonville area. And um, my hobbies are golf, ballroom dancing. I'm involved in social activities. And also in my church, I've done a number of mission trips. And I, I also enjoy, besides writing, which recently I published the book in uh, Supernatural Rescue. But I also like to speak for groups and share the wonderful things that God has done in my life. Whoa, you got a full life there. I do. Where have you been at on missions trips? I've been to Guatemala. I've been to China. I've been to Peru. Mostly Guatemala. I've been to Guatemala three different times. And um, after I earned my Ph.D. in psychology, I did a, a, quite a bit of teaching on mm-hmm. marriage and family and communication because in Guatemala, they don't get a lot of that. Wow. And so my missionary friend said this would be a real gift for them. So I traveled there and, and it was to help with relationships yeah. because through the years, my counseling involved helping people with their relationships primarily. Wow. So now I know our listeners are like, okay, well, do we have an expert on the show today? Or does Linda actually have a story of trauma? (laughs) Believe me, believe me. Um, Five years ago, I realized that honestly, I didn't know anything, that I had to rely on God totally, and that totally it was his power and and my weakness that would get me through my circumstances. Well, let's talk about that because our show is all about helping our listeners, just like you and I, who have found themselves faced with a trauma, expected, planned, or otherwise, where they have a choice on whether to stay paralyzed by the reality of it or find the inner strength or support or higher power to go forward. What type of trauma have you walked through, Linda? Well, five years ago, the end of 2012, um, I discovered I had a tennis ball sized tumor in the frontal lobe of my brain. Oh, my goodness. Which required nearly an eight hour brain surgery in which they had to cut my head from ear to ear and remove the tumor piece by piece and then basically restitch my head back. Oh, my goodness. And I, yes, it was very surreal. I'd always been healthy. My parents were healthy. My father lived to be 100 years old. And at that time, he was about 98. And I never had any health problems. And so when someone said, you have a brain tumor in your frontal lobe, I thought, oh, you know, there was a little bit of denial there. Yeah. Oh, I can't be. You know, I feel fine. I don't have headaches. I don't have symptoms. But yet other people noticed that I had not been quite myself and mm. that I was behaving a little erratically, let's say. Now, if you don't mind sharing with our listeners, how old were you at that point when you got this diagnosis? At that point, I was 59 years old. So you're talking about at 59, you get this life altering diagnosis. Did it require immediate? Like, was it like simultaneously you got the diagnosis and then you were in for surgery? Talk to us about that. Yes. Um, basically, um, well, when I went to the, to the doctor initially, mm-hmm. she said, oh, it's probably nothing. But, you know, we probably should do a test. So mm-hmm. they did the MRI and then they found the large tumor. But yes, I had to start interviewing doctors. Who was I going to choose? Because as we know, many people that go through brain surgery never recover. And I felt I'd had a good life, you know, but I felt I was in shock because Mm -hmm. I hadn't been sick and I was really a healthy person. But uh, the surgery, I found out the end of October, the surgery took place in early December. So it was very quick. Wow. So when you say, goodness, I'm just trying to process this myself and I'm not used. So I can't imagine after 59 years of living a healthy, full life 
filled with love and filled with a lot of accomplishments and achievements and connections that you get faced with this. What did that do to you on the inside, Linda? Well, I know you had to interview doctors. That was right, the practical right. side. But on the emotional side, how did you handle this? Well, you know, I was in shock, as anybody would be if you found out this information. But, you know, you don't know what to make of it. And there again, I had never been really, really ill and, you know, requiring such a huge surgery. And so it was, a lot of it was a shock, but it was also busyness of trying to get to the mm-hmm. next step, finding out which doctor we would choose. But then thinking, well, maybe I won't live to be yeah. 60. My birthday was January in, you know, just a month away. And thinking, well, you know, I can't believe that maybe I won't be 60 years old. And then thinking, you know, you start thinking, did you do something yeah. wrong? And mm-hmm. you shouldn't feel that way, but you do. Yeah. And I mean, the last 15 years, I'd run a nonprofit and I counsel people, many of them pro bono or reduced rate just to help people because I wanted to help people. I had done the mission trips. And so I, you know, it goes through your head, why and why me? My parents, my mother had lived to be 87. My father was 98 at the time. And like, why and how did this happen? Mm. And it's just, you know, it's a mystery. And then preparing yourself for maybe you won't make your next birthday. Mm. So it's it's a lot of thoughts, a lot of confusion and not understanding. But so many things in this world we don't understand yeah. till later. And honestly, when I wrote the book, I began to make sense after the recovery, but I was sick for a really long time. Mm. So you were starting to describe that paralyzing why. Exactly. That polarizes your mindset and you begin to conjure up everything under the sun to try to make sense of something that doesn't make sense. Exactly. What came to my heart that some of our listeners might be thinking as they hear this story that you're sharing with us today is what was that first day like for you after you got, because I mean, you went from one life to another life. In less than 24 hours after having that diagnosis, what was that day of and after like for Linda? Well, I think that day was more shock. The more traumatic day Mm -hmm. was for me the day after the surgery Mm -hmm. that I was like a different person and I couldn't understand. I couldn't. I couldn't figure out what to do. I was what so was empty. What was traumatic for you about it? I know you had the eight-hour surgery. I'm, I'm certainly not minimizing that. But in no. your own words, what was the traumatic part about that for you? Well, you have to realize when you have a tumor the size of a tennis ball and it's in your frontal lobe of your brain, that's the area of your brain that you, you think and you feel. And, and it, it is, it's that thinking part of your brain. Mm. And when I woke up... From the surgery, I mean, I, first of all, they'd had me, they put me on a drug. And according to my husband, I was talking really fast, but it was the drug that was causing that to happen. Mm -hmm. When I, when I got home from the hospital, I felt totally empty and I had trouble forming my thoughts. I could not walk. My body had no balance Mm. and I felt like a vegetable. People say, what does it feel like to be a vegetable? All I can say is I put my face in my hands and I cried and I said, I don't know how to do this Mm. because I could not make sense. I didn't know how to form my thoughts. I had trouble speaking and I couldn't walk. And the home health care nurse that came to the home said to me, you need to take a journal and write things down. The problem was when I started writing, I couldn't read my own writing. Mm. I could not form language in handwriting that made any sense. And so that took some time to get to the point where I could actually write, where I could read my own writing. But, you know, I'm really glad, Mm -hmm. um, even though I probably cried every day, literally, I'm not exaggerating for the first month because I felt like I was a mess and I didn't know how to get better and I didn't know what to do. But the beginnings of that journal writing is what eventually came, became my book, um, Supernatural Rescue, and helped me actually track my my recovery, which was very good advice that the that the healthcare professional gave me to start writing things down. 
So build, to build a context of the impact that that surgery had on you, what all was affected? I, I've heard you mention certain things, but I want to make sure our listeners get it clear. Like this is what empty looked at like for me. Okay. So all, what was all impacted? Okay. The largest impact. And I told you about my brain. I told you I couldn't walk physically. I mm-hmm. couldn't think well. I couldn't communicate well. And I was, I felt depressed. It was a different kind of depression. But the thing that I was totally unprepared for is I felt like God had left me. (sighs) And I have a chapter in the book called The Ten Dark Days for 10 days. And I don't know why this was, but when I was a young child and I asked God to come into my life, I felt it's hard to explain, but as a young child, he honored my requests for that feeling or that, that assurance that he was in my life. And for whatever reason, after the surgery, I felt he was gone. I felt Mm. he had abandoned me and he was gone. And I didn't know what had happened or, you know, how I deserved for God to leave me. But I was so real, the feeling for 10 days that on day 10, which was literally the day before Christmas, I had a near-death experience and I felt my spirit separate from my body. Oh, my goodness. And people say, what does that feel like? It's very difficult to put into words. All I can say was I was laying on the couch. I could, I didn't have the balance to go upstairs to my bedroom. So I was sleeping on the couch and I was laying there and I could feel, slowly feel like my spirit was moving away from my body and it was getting closer and closer to the front door. And when it was at the front door, literally ready to leave, and I believe I was dying at that point. Mm. I believe my spirit was leaving, had left my body and it was at the front door ready to go. I saw this gigantic hand come out, and it pulled me back into my body. And immediately, I knew God was there. I knew he was back. Mm. And I said, God, why? And why did I feel you were gone for 10 days? Because it was like, I had been close to God, and I never expected to go through that. And I thought, God, you could have prevented this from Mm -hmm. happening. Why did this happen? Some things we cannot answer why. They just do. Wow. So did you get an answer to your whys? Well, eventually... It was a long time. I, you know, I was sick. The recovery was very, very slow, and I had to learn how to walk. Three months learning how to walk again to balance myself. And I had been a ballroom dancer, mm. which is one of the things God has restored. And one of the victories I have now being, I was actually honored recently as a ballroom dance hero, which was very humbling. But that's another story. Um, I couldn't walk, so I had to learn how to walk. I had to get my balance back. And they put you on a balance board. Then they put you on a sponge. And and you're balancing, you know, one foot at a time. But my brain was so messed up for so long. And I went to a major medical institution in my area. And I said, can you just test me? Test my brain. Help me get my brain back. Help me get my organization of thoughts back. And the sad news was when after they ran through all the tests and I did all the testing, they said, there's nothing we can do for you. Mm, My goodness. And I thought there's got to be. There's got to be. My nonprofit was hope for the hurting. And I have always had hope, some kind of hope in God. Even when people say you can't do it, I know our God is a God of miracles. And so I started reading books and I started getting other opinions because I thought this can't be true. God would not have gotten me to this point if I wasn't going to recover. And I believed yeah. that I would recover. And so I started reading books and getting clues how I could rehab my own brain. Mm. But it was a very difficult and slow, slow, slow process. How long was that process? Well, I would tell you it's about eight months, but something else that was not good happened about eight months later. When I started feeling better, when I felt like I'm more like myself, and you have to remember, I had to shut down my practice. Mm. Um, I couldn't, you know, all those people that I'd helped that were wanting counseling, I couldn't help them. I wasn't able to reopen the practice and do the things I had formerly done. But about eight months, I thought, you know, I'm getting better. I feel, I feel I'm better. I feel like maybe I could get my life back. But one morning I woke up, I had pain all over my body and I couldn't sleep anymore. And I went back to the doctor and I said, I don't understand, you know, what is happening? And they said, it's fibromyalgia. You had a traumatic injury to your brain. And the the whole eight hour brain surgery was a trauma. This is common when people have traumas, you can develop fibromyalgia. But I will tell you that recovering from the fibromyalgia was actually much worse than recovering from the brain surgery. Are you serious? That was a very long haul. And after all that walking, I told you learning how to walk Mm -hmm. and balance, I fell down the stairs and broke my ankle. Oh, my goodness. And this was during a time that I was having dreams that I was going to get better and I was going to walk away from it. And I went up to 
care for my father in Ohio, who was 98 years old. And I got an electrical shock and I went out in the garage and I just screamed and cried. And I said, God, God, why? And this, I know this is going to sound bad, but I said, why didn't you let me die? Mm. You know, I wasn't prepared for all the suffering. Ooh. And that night, you know, See, when people say to me, oh, don't get angry at God, I think he knows our emotions. He knows our hearts. So be open to him. Tell him what you feel. But, you know, I was upset and I yelled at God, why didn't you let me die? That night, a light came through the ceiling Mm. and there was a figure on the other side. And I believe it was an angel, but it was God giving me hope that, yes, I was going to get through it. Mm. Wow. Your story is breathtaking. But the recovery from the fibromyalgia was a longer recovery. And I, there's so many details I could tell you, but I will tell you, even when I wrote, finished the book, I was getting better. But within the past year to two years, I have, God gave me a whole new way, and it will be in my next book, how I recovered from the fibromyalgia, a way that I did not expect where I would be totally recovered. And I give glory to God, and I'm so thankful. And Everything that's happened, I feel I've been so weak, but God has just strengthened me in my weakness and brought me through it. And I'm so grateful and I give the glory to him. Amen. So you said so many incredible things. I have to thank you. You're welcome. Wow. So as I'm processing just the weight of your story and the impact how long was that total journey, including fibromyalgia? Yes. yes. That. How long was that process? Well, honestly, I have to say um, it really wasn't till um, a year ago, January. So that would have been four years, five years. So after five 13, years. Yeah, five years. You know, let's just be real of suffering. To a degree. Yeah, and I, I did get a lot better, but the pain... You know, and the the things that God allowed me to do with virtually no sleep because I had pain. But, you know, the fibromyalgia is another story, maybe for another topic. (laughs) But you become another person. And I didn't like the person I was. And I had to apologize to a lot of people because of the pain and suffering. I wasn't always the person that I knew that God wanted me to be. So, again, let's just say, for lack of better words, suffering. It wasn't the life you expected, you planned or hoped for. It felt like you had led a life that it should have been that way as a result of it. How did you and how would you speak to a person that may be faced with a diagnosis that's affected them in a similar way? It may not be the exact one with the tennis ball sized tumor in their brain, but it's changed them. Like I had a good family member of mine who ended up getting lymphoma and for two years, who could have told her? what that would have done to her. And literally she didn't want to live at one point because her life just felt pointless and just exasperated with pain. Yes. And one procedure after another. I believe that there are some listeners that will tune into this episode and look for that source of strength. What would you say to them? They're right in the thick of it. You're coming. You're still got your journey. I'm not saying you're out all the way, but you're certainly not where you were five exactly. years ago. Exactly. What would you say of the, to them? And they're in year one, day one of this journey that you're now in five, six years later. Well, first of all, I would say do not give up. Mm-hmm. And the messages you get, the negativity, and it can come from other people. It can come from your own self. Um, but don't give up. Don't give up. And I would also say, if you don't have a faith in God, give God a chance. Because when people say you can't, God will say you can. And my life is evidence of that. Mm. And even in myself, like getting upset with God, asking God all the whys, and just Mm. feeling I was never going to get better, my my life would never be the same. Having said that, I still had hope. I had hope. That in my weakness, somehow God would strengthen me and get me through Mm -hmm. that. And he did. But I think you have to be careful. The messages you hear, if you're not getting positive messages, look for people that are positive. Read books that are positive. 
what people say can be out of their own negativity. Mm-hmm. Some people only know what's negative, but also not everybody has all the answers. If your traditional doctor doesn't give you hope, like in my case, they said there's nothing we can do for you. Maybe look at some other sources, look yeah. at some other doctors, maybe non-traditional medicine, open your mind up to what else might be up there. But the main thing is just not to give up. And to keep looking for encouragement and looking for positivity, even though you're not seeing that in your current situation. And I know that's easier said than done. I've been there. <laughs> but just keep pushing through the best you can and do not give up. That's exceptional. So tell our listeners, what's life like now for Linda? Five years post this life-changing experience. Well, I will say that God has restored a very large part of my life. Awesome. Okay, there's some scars there. I don't smell anymore. The nerve, when, when the tumor was taken out, the tumor that's responsibility for your sense of smell, it was taken. I can't smell. I've got had memory loss. Mm. But, you know, like people said to me early on, make new memories. Ooh. Some of those years, some of those memories are gone and I cannot restore them. Um, But overall, my life is good. I've written one book. I plan on writing another book this year. I've been able to share with groups, but also I share a one-to-one all the time. God gives me opportunities to share with people going through difficult circumstances. So my life, I want to honor God. I want to give Him glory, and I want to encourage other people. Now, because of the circumstances I've been through, I have the ability to share and encourage in a way that I never did before. And so when people say, do you wish it hadn't happened? You know, it's funny, but I say no. Even through the pain and suffering, Mm -hmm. it's brought me to a place that now I can help people in a different way. And I do think it was part of God's plan. And I am grateful for that. Wow. Are you dancing again? I'm dancing again. (laughs) And this was another miracle. I received a word as a ballroom dance hero. Um, at a big competition last summer. And they said, because I encourage other people. And then I've been through extreme adversity. They gave me an award. And I was so humble because like I tell people, it was God. I give God the the glory. He healed me. He brought me back. I persevered, yes. But I do believe without God, I'm not sure Mm -hmm. the the same results would have come about. In fact, I don't believe they would have. Because he has been, I've been weak so many Mm -hmm. times in the past four or five years saying, I can't do it. I don't know how to do it. God strengthened me. And there's been miracles that I cannot even begin to number because of not my strength, but his strength in me. Amen. Amen. Jeremiah 29 says, God is a God of restoration. Mm -hmm. He has a plan for our life and he strengthens us and gives us what we need Through that plan, if we just believe the story's not over, and this is the other thing I would tell people, your story is not over yet. You may think it is, as I did at one point, but it is not. And God has a plan for you to have a better future. Mm Mm-hmm. I totally agree. I'm getting all fired up in here. I'm like, let's let's go conquer the world (laughs) together. Oh, goodness. Oh, Linda, I got to say thank you again. Well, you're welcome. And thank I feel you. like you have given someone their dance shoes today. Thank someone you. Someone who thought their story was over. They thought it ended with the diagnosis. They thought there was no hope. They thought it would not get better. And your your story has become like a sunlight for them that they can see a glimpse of hope in what feels like a really dark and desperate situation. And I'm sure because of that, many of them are going to want to connect to you. How can our listeners connect and grow with you? We got book two coming out. Where's yes. your, your book available? They want all those details so they can follow you and continue to be fueled with hope from your journey. Well, thank you. Um, my book is Supernatural Rescue. It is available through Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Or if you want to contact me direct, I'm available for speaking and can provide signed copies for people as well. Um, my email address is hope for hurting. That's H O P E F O R H U R T I N G at AOL.com. Woo! Listen, guys, you want to connect. This lady right here, if you were sitting where I'm sitting at, you would be touched in a way I can't describe. Get her book. I rarely say this. Get her book. If you are finding yourself 
hurting and paralyzed by the whys of something that you didn't ask, you don't feel like you deserved, you can't reconcile why is it happening and why is it happening now and maybe even why is it happening again? Or maybe it's happening to someone you love, you care, a child, a spouse, or someone else. Get her book. I believe it is going to bless you with hope that I can't describe. Remember, trauma is not the end of your story. Triumph is. I look forward to connecting with you all again soon. Until that time, have an exceptional day. Thank you for tuning into our podcast today. For all things Launch Now, log on to launchnowus.com for info on products, resources, and upcoming events. We are looking forward to connecting with you and enriching your life through our next episode. And remember, you have what it takes to press play. Have a super duper epic week.